Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a tough task giving the last lecture in a two-week summer school and all of you thinking, just want to get out of here, uh, go and get some alcohol on the streets of Trieste and stuff like that. So I'll try not to delay uh, all that happy stuff uh, for too long. Uh, so, but today we're going to talk about something fun. Okay? We're going to be talking about the future of at least axion physics, uh, interesting things that are happening in the field right now. Uh, things that are actually, I think, very exciting in terms of both experimental uh, ways to push forward in the field as well as, so I think, some interesting theoretical developments. So just to give you a very quick overview, uh, we think axions are good and cool because uh, they're very general. You mumble a few things about some global symmetry that no one knows about. Somewhere in the ultraviolet, it's broken. It's like magic. You mumble that and out pops a Goldstone boson and uh, you can go detect it uh, at really low energies without having to spend a gigantic amount of money to build a huge collider. And if you ma succeed, if you actually detect that, then you learn something about very high scales. We said that the one particular Goldstone boson, the QCD axion, was particularly well motivated because it solved a strong CP problem. Uh, but in the same philosophy, there could be other such particles, and one should go search for them. Okay? And uh, uh, one interesting thing we learned was that very easily, these particles can be all of the dark matter of the universe. Simply because if these fields exist, then in the early universe, in general, they will have some initial value. And that initial value of the field will correspond to some energy density. And that energy density can easily be dark matter. That's what we learned yesterday. And uh, uh, here is a review of all of the constraints, etc., of this phenomenology. Most of it is directly applicable to the QCD axion. But similar things are also true for axion-like particles. Okay. I mean, there are a few things here and there, but in general, this is sort of the ball game. Uh, roughly, if uh, the coupling constant Fa, okay, that is the scale at which the symmetry is broken, if that is, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, uh, too small, so in particular smaller than about 10 to the 9 GeV, it's just ruled out, right? It's uh, too strongly coupled to the standard model. It'll be produced in, in stars, white dwarfs, a lot of other things, uh, uh, making, uh, uh, you know, it's just too observable. So. Anything below that, essentially ruled out. Above that is sort of essentially open territory. And for the QCD axion, if this parameter Fa is above 10 to the 12 GeV and larger, it can be all of the dark matter. And around 10 to the 12 GeV, there are these experiments that we talked about, things like ADMX, which we will sort of review again later today, uh, uh, where th there is a good way to search for this if it happens to be the dark matter of the universe. But you know, the parameter space is huge, right? So this does raises a, a, an interesting theoretical question, right? Uh, um, if FA happened to be big, right, how do we find it? How do we search for these things? Uh, the challenge, of course, is that for large FA, one has to beat a small coupling, right, because all of the uh, couplings of the axion are suppressed by this big scale. So how do you overcome this uh, big scale in your ability to search these things? And some people do theoretically also think that large values of FA are, in a sense, theoretically more reasonable. Because you know, we're breaking some global symmetry here to get these axions. And uh, you might think that these global symmetries should be broken you know, at the gut scale or the Planck scale, you know, things where fundamental physics is supposed to arise from. So your naive expectation from theory for where these scales might be is also actually pretty high. Of course, that's just theoretical prejudice. But still, you know, it's, a, it's a good thing to keep in mind when you want to think about why you want to search for these high F axions. OK. But uh, experimentally, we can just ask, what can we do you know, to beat this uh, uh, small coupling? How do we go after these things? So I'm going to talk about two ideas, these sort of experimental ideas, if you will, uh, uh, both of them very recent, uh, and uh, you know, sort of uh, two strategies. One is, if you have a new particle, one thing you can try to do is to produce it somehow and then detect it. Okay? That's one way to do it. Uh, the other would be to say that maybe the Almighty has been kind to you. And he has provided uh, uh, the entire universe with axion dark matter. Okay, it's a reasonable assumption. So if you uh, you know are, are in that kind of a world where the axions are dark matter, you could then try to think about ways to detect that. Okay, so th those are the two you know ways in which you try to detect a new particle. You produce it and then detect it, or it's already there and you try to detect it. So in this game of producing and detecting this thing, uh, remember we're talking about a particle that is super weakly coupled. So we're going to talk about a new phenomenon, okay? something that most particle physicists are not familiar with, but it's a well-understood phenomenon that is called superradiance. We'll describe what that is. And uh, we'll discuss how superradiance in sort of realistic astrophysical systems can actually co uh, potentially constrain uh, this kind of particle. And uh, if the axion happened to be dark matter, 
then we will talk about a new class of experiments that essentially leverage nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, as a way to search for these uh, particles. So we'll, that, that's going to be the first part of the lecture today. All right, so let's talk about superradiance and extremal astrophysical systems. We'll define each of these words shortly. Here is a basic plot, OK? Uh, there is some phenomenon called superradiance. I'm sure most of you don't know what it is, so don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of define what it is pretty soon. And, but here's what it really does, OK? So uh, it turns out to be an instability of rotating systems, or, or really any rotating system, OK? So if you have some rotating system, uh, because of superradiance, uh, it will slow down, OK? So in a sense, in particular, if there are light, massive bosons, such as axions, that are coupled to some uh, rotating system, this rotating system will slow down by emitting these axions. Okay? So that's, that's what this phenomenon ultimately does for you. And the basic idea is that uh, we have seen such rotating systems out in the universe. So you can go and measure and say, oh, there is some star, for example, that is spinning at some certain rate. And then what you will do is you will calculate and say, oh, if this axion existed, then the star cannot possibly be spinning at that rate. And given that we have seen stars spinning at that rate, we can therefore place constraints on such particles. Okay, that's the basic idea. If you observe a, a system rotating at a certain speed, that can uh, put constraints on these kinds of particles. Okay? Uh, so that's just the game of putting uh, constraints. If you're a more optimistic person, then you might say, well, let us say we go and uh, observe a huge number of such rotating systems. And maybe you will find that, that there is you know, some range of frequencies where there are no rotating systems at all. Right? You find some statistically significant gap in the, in the uh, uh, rotation rate of various stars, for example. And uh, that statistically significant gap may imply that there are such light bosons in the theory because they're actually causing these objects to spin down. Okay? That's the basic uh, idea. Uh, there has been some work done on this. Uh, the previous work has been largely limited to black holes. And uh, in fact, this is a much more general instability and can also be used to, uh, 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 you know, one can also use things like millisecond pulsars to actually search for this. And that is something that I've been working on for some time. Okay, so that's the basic idea, right? You look for a star that is spinning, you see a star that's spinning, that puts a constraint. And uh, 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 if you don't see the star, uh, the particle may exist there. Yes? There is a non-trivial dependence on, on, on the rotation rate. Well, well, we'll see that shortly. All right, so what is superradiance, right? Before we get into superradiance specifically, let's understand you know, something very boring. Okay, this is radiation from just some rotating object. So for example, let's say we take a pulsar, okay, or just a magnet or whatever, and that's a pulsar. That pulsar has some rotation rate, and it's got a magnetic field. Right? Pulsars have big magnetic fields. And uh, the reason why pulsars are pulsars is because the magnetic field and the rotation rate are not aligned with each other. Right? They're in general at some angle. So uh, the star is spinning. And as the star spins, there's going to be a time-varying magnetic dipole. Right? Because there's a magnetic dipole moment, it's spinning. And as there's a time-varying magnetic dipole, there will be dipole radiation at the frequency of rotation. Right? That's, not, you know, that's just standard stuff that you calculate from Jackson. Nothing deep about this. Let me ask you a question. What if the magnetic dipole is aligned with the rotation axis? Does this system emit radiation, electromagnetic radiation? What's the answer? Come on, you know it. Yes or no? 50-50, right? Huh? No? Yeah, why, why is the answer no? Right, so if you think about it, the, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in the first case, when the, when the magnetic mo moment was not aligned with the uh, rotation rate of the star, one reason why the star was able to emit radiation and slow down was because, well, you know, it can actually produce a photon, and by doing so, it can conserve energy and angular momentum, right? That's just some kinematics. You can produce a photon, the photon carries away some energy from the system, uh, decreases the angular momentum of the star. That's an allowed process, it's kinematically allowed. So when the magnetic field is aligned with the, with the rotation rate of the star, that kinematics is still true. Right? You can still emit a photon, and you can still uh, 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 slow down. Right? That is still kinematically allowed. So when something is kinematically allowed, and it doesn't occur, what is the only possibility? The coupling must vanish. Right? That's what must happen. Right? In quantum mechanics in general, if you've got a uh, uh, phase space for a process, 
and a non-zero coupling, then the process will occur, right? So in this case, the phase space is always non-zero, right? Because you, know, you can just easily calculate that. So the only reason why when the uh, uh, a magnetic field, when, 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 the, when the magnetic field is aligned with the rotation rate of the star, with the spin axis of the star, if there is no radiation, it's because the coupling must somehow vanish. Okay? And why does the coupling vanish? It's actually pretty easy to see, right? Because in reality, uh, think about your star, right? Uh, this is your star, and uh, 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 you know, it's, it's supposed to be completely axisymmetric. That is what we've assumed over here, right? When it's exactly aligned. And uh, you're trying to emit some photon which has some angular momentum, right? It's some e to the i m phi times some y l m or something, right? Or maybe the y l m actually contains that, whatever. There's some azimuthal angular momentum that's in the system. Now, the key problem is that if you try to couple that uh, uh, state, right, to the star, you've got to perform some integral around the star, right? And if the star is completely symmetric, okay, then this integral vanishes, right? Because you're, in, you're, you're integrating e to the i m phi around some symmetric thing, and uh, the word zero, okay? So the coupling vanishes. And the moment that coupling uh, becomes non-zero, because let's say you put a little dent over here, there'll be radiation, right? Like nothing surprising about that, okay? So you've got to break that axis symmetry in order for you to have this kind of dipole radiation, okay? Uh, uh, it, so the kinematics is still allowed, all right? So actually, this is just a slide that, uh, in a sense, reinforces that point. Uh, 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 the radiated photon must carry angular momentum, which means it has to have some e to the i m phi, right? And it is unable to couple to an axisymmetric system precisely because of, of the symmetry. The symmetry essentially cancels the coupling. Even though kinematically, the star can lose energy and angular momentum by emitting light degrees of freedom, right? That's still kinematically allowed. The coupling is zero. That's why it doesn't occur, okay? But come on, this is crazy, right? Because we do have light degrees of freedom that are coupled to the stellar medium. They exist, it's photons or whatever. They, they are coupled to the, to, the, to the stellar medium. So at some level, there must be radiation, right? Because come on, it's quantum mechanics, right? You can't really have something where uh, uh, there's a light degree of freedom existing. You can emit it and you can slow down, but still you don't do it, right? So the reason why you didn't do it here was because of something stupid. It was because of the fact that somehow you lost your coupling uh, due to some symmetry, right? That's why there was no radiation. Let's think about a closely rated problem, the problem of absorption, okay? So suppose I take a star, right? That's sort of axisymmetric, right? Nice axisymmetric star or a pulsar where the magnetic field and everything is aligned in, in, in the direction. So that guy is not emitting standard electromagnetic radiation. We know that doesn't happen. But let's take a photon and throw it at the star, right? What happens to that photon? Will it get absorbed or will it, will it just bounce around? What would it do? Well, I'm, the title is absorption, so clearly the photon gets absorbed, right? So if you take a, a, a star and I throw a photon at it, it's going to get absorbed. What happens is that the, uh, uh, the photon comes in, there's a star sitting there, and the photon will excite some angular momentum mode, right? Some, you know, some stellar excitation. It will be some eddy currents or phonons or whatever in the stellar medium, and the star will continue rotating, right? So what you realize here is a central point, which is that the angular momentum of the photon will couple to moments of the stellar excitation, right? So it is true that the photon, a photon with angular momentum, is unable to couple to a rigid star, right? If the star has no degrees of freedom at all, then the photon can't do anything. But the moment the uh, star has excitations, phonon modes, you know, uh, uh, eddy currents or whatever, your photon can couple to it. Right? That, that's exactly what happens. The moment there's absorption, your photon, which has an angular momentum, is able to couple to the star, even if the star is symmetric. Right? Because these excitations, if you will, break the symmetry. So that means we've now found a coupling between an axisymmetric star and a photon that has, that has angular momentum. So now turn the problem around. Right? So if you have a star that is, uh, let's say, completely axisymmetric, it is possible that it can emit a photon create some stellar excitation, like some eddy current or whatever, and then still continue rotating, right? The fact that absorption exists means that this matrix element is non-zero. It is the same process. All I've done is flip the direction of the arrows. Is that clear? Right? You know, one of those things where you just rotate which thing is happening where. So this process has a non-zero matrix element simply because absorption is true. That is, in the previous slide, we had the photon come in, hit the star, and get absorbed by creating some stellar excitation, which means that if I read the arrow this way, the star can come in, emit some photon, create some stellar excitation, and then slow down, 
right? That process, that angular moment, that uh, uh, coupling exists, the matrix element exists. And this will obviously happen as long as it's kinematically allowed. That's quantum mechanics, right? Once you've got a coupling and you've got phase space, shit happens, right? Uh, I don't know if I can swear here, uh, you know. But anyway, uh, 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 so that's right. So uh, once the kinematics is allowed, this happens. So let's just calculate the kinematics, right? When does this process actually occur? So what is the kinematical calculation? The kinematical calculation says that it better be the case that I'm able to emit this photon. This photon must have positive energy and angular momentum. I mean, the, the angular momentum can be plus or minus, of course. But the energy of the photon must be positive. And the star you know, has some initial angular momentum and is going to some final angular momentum. right? And this must be bigger than that, obviously. Uh, and it creates some positive energy excitation for the, uh, uh, the star. So you can go through the rigmarole of calculating this, right, to, to sort of conserve energy and angular momentum in this process. And you will find that as long as the emitted angular momentum of the photon satisfies this condition, that is m omega is bigger than the energy of the photon, as long as this condition is satisfied, uh, 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 one can actually have, I mean, the, the uh, kinematics is satisfied. That is, this excitation can have positive energy, right? So what this is telling you is that if I emit a photon of the right angular momentum, right? If this m has to be sufficiently big such that the, uh, this quantity, m omega, minus the energy of the photon is positive, as long as that condition is satisfied, I can create a positive energy stellar excitation and, 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 and there is phase space for this process to occur, right? So one can indeed, therefore, ask the question, which is that if I have the star that is spinning down, right? This star can emit a photon of sufficiently high angular momentum and create some excitation that is, you know, will therefore be, have positive energy, and the rotation rate of the star will thus decay. Okay? So this raises an, an uh, obvious question, which is that all I have said is m has to be big enough for this process to occur. Right? So why do I not produce m's that are arbitrarily big, you know, m of infinity or whatever? Right? In which case, it would seem like a star that is spinning at some relatively low uh, frequency is able to produce particles of arbitrarily high energy. Right? Something must break down. And indeed, something does break down which is that if you, if you are trying to produce uh, modes of very, very large angular momentum, okay, convince yourself that if you have a mode of very large angular momentum, that mode will be far from the star, right? If you, if, because if you're a mode of large angular momentum, you're pretty far, that's, how, that's where your localization exists. Your mode is very far from the star, which means that you have very suppressed coupling with the star itself. Because your star is some finite size object, okay? And if you have a mode of high angular momentum, the mode is far away, so there is no overlap between you and the mode. So even though you can kinematically produce it, the rate for that is very slow. It doesn't, doesn't occur. Okay? So, uh, 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 but it does tell you that as you decrease the angular momentum, right, eventually you'll have enough of an overlap that you can efficiently produce this object. So this is the comparison between multiple radiation, the things that you know and love from Jackson. Maybe love is too strong a word. Things that you know from Jackson and the super radiant phenomenon. Multiple radiation exists any time you have a non-axisymmetric system, right? There is some star that is, you know, uh, uh, the, the magnetic field and the rotation rate are not aligned. The moment you have that, uh, this process occurs because there is a non-zero coupling and there is a non-zero kinematic uh, condition allowed, and uh, this guy will just emit this photon and radiate. S importantly, the radiation will always occur at multiples of that frequency, right? That's what multiple radiation is. That's a fundamental frequency at which is radiating at. Super radiance is an instability of any absorptive rotating system. This is important, right? Uh, when, the, when your star is axisymmetric, this vertex gets killed. So the moment your system is absorptive, that basically means that uh, you know, there are these soft excitations in the star itself, then your star is able to emit some photon, create some excitation, and then decay down. Okay? But this is a three-body process. right? I'm producing three different excitations. This is basically continuum emission. In multiple radiation, it's two body, right? I always go produce one thing and slow down. Okay, so, th so that's why it occurs at fixed frequencies. Here it's basically continuum. I can sort of emit a, an arbitrarily soft or arbitrarily high energy uh, photon. The coupling of these things, of course, will depend upon what the uh, frequency is, uh, but I can you know, do that for any of these energies. Okay? So that's how they're pretty different between these two things. So usually, okay, uh, when you think about pulsars and stuff like that, uh, you'd be a crazy person to go and say, oh, the pulsar is emitting super radiant photons. It, of course, occurs because the pulsar emission is dominated by, absorption, uh, by the standard multiple radiation because most pulsars you see 
are, uh, 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 you know, the multiple radiation when it exists, it's just a single vertex like that, it's sort of, it's dominant, right? It just happens very nicely. Absorption is a higher order process. It's got to create all this, you know, funny modes in the star and, and stuff like that. So it's more irritating. It's, it's, it's a weaker process. So that's why, typically, when you have electromagnetic radiation, what you study from Jackson is correct, that it is indeed multiple emission that dominates. There's an important difference between things like photons, okay, that, that you normally calculate, uh, where uh, uh, multiple radiation can easily dominate, and in fact does dominate, uh, versus things like axions. So why am I, for example, standing here and saying, oh, you know, uh, we've indeed observed these sort of, sort, of, sort of rotating pulsars, right? And they're indeed slowing down because of electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetism is like way strong, more strongly coupled than axions, obviously, right? So why is there even a hope in hell that I can actually constrain something about axions but by observing this rotation rate of a, of a pulsar when uh, electromagnetism is so much more strongly coupled, right? How is that ever, why would this process that is so weak to begin with ever useful? There's a very important difference between a massless particle like a photon and a massive particle like an axion. That's a mass, right? So uh, what does that mean for you? So if you take a star and, and you know, think about an axisymmetric star, right? Like a, you know, it could be a pulsar, a black hole, or whatever. Uh, I mean, the axisymmetry is not even that important. It's just that it's some big gravitationally, you know, some big star, right? Got a lot of gravity around it. Now, if you take your axion particle, which has a mass, then quantum mechanically, there are gravitational bound states of that uh, field, of, of that particle around the star, right? So if you have a star and uh, there's some gravity around it, you take your axion field uh, and then you calculate its modes, you will find there are, you know, bound states around the star, right? Just like a, like a hydrogenic atom, right? Exactly the same way, there are these bound states of these axions or whatever that are around the star. And the Bohr radius, if you, go, if you trouble yourself and calculate what the Bohr radius is, the Bohr radius is like 1 over gm mu squared, okay? Because gm mu is like the alpha of the thing, whatever. Calculate, you'll, you'll just find that, okay? Obviously, as the mass of the particle goes down, these gravitational bound states are far and far away. Because obviously, if your particle is massless, there are no bound states, right? There's like, you can't bind it at all. Uh, so you already see that once you have a mass, Interesting things happen because you have these gravitational bound states of your axion or whatever around the star. They just exist automatically, okay? Now, here's where the cool thing happens, right? Which is that if you take your super radiance phenomenon, the super radiance is going to produce a lot of photons. That's what it will be dominated by. But once in a while, it will produce axions as well, okay? Like a, in a very weak way. And, uh, 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 but it can emit into these gravitational bound states of the axion around the star, okay? It'll populate that very weakly. But this bound state is stuck there. It's not going anywhere. It's stuck right there, which means you have the possibility of a Bose enhancement, okay? You will slowly populate that mode, and eventually that mode will become order one, and then exponential amplification occurs, okay? So once you are in a situation where this Bose enhancement becomes significant, this process uh, that is happening into, you know, the slow way of, of populating this mode with axions suddenly becomes way faster than your electromagnetic emission, right? Because you're exponentially amplified, okay? That is how, even though these axions are much more weakly coupled than electromagnetism, precisely because they have these bound states around the star, which photons don't have, the super radiant emission can be very, very effective, okay, in slowing this down. That's the key idea. Okay, and uh, 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 the central point then is that this process will be efficient in certain cases. We will, we will shortly see what those certain cases are. Uh, they could be very efficient if there are new light particles that are sufficiently strongly coupled to the stellar medium. We will define that. And uh, the basic idea, therefore, is the following, is that you can use the observations of, say, rotating black holes or pulsars. These happen to be the systems where this emission is particularly uh, useful, uh, where it's enhanced, and we will again see why that is the case. So the idea is that if you see such rotating systems, you can then say, oh, this process did not occur. So axions of that particular mass, for example, did not occur. Okay, that's the idea. All right, so that was like a, the broad picture of you know, the, the, the global physics idea for uh, how that actually occurs. Let's see some mathematics, right? Uh, 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 how does it happen? Here is the set of equations that tell you how the system happens. So all we're gonna do is take a particle psi, okay, like an axion or whatever, some field psi, it's got a mass, okay? And let's say it's interacting with the medium. 
uh, and the medium itself is moving with some velocity. Okay? So this is the equation of motion for this. It's a Klein-Gordon equation. Box psi plus mu squared psi, right? Uh, plus the effective potential that the psi is sitting in. So for example, if this is uh, a, 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 like an axion field sitting in, in gravity, this V effective is just the gravitational potential that it's sitting under. What is this term? Okay, this term, which is C V alpha grad alpha psi, that is an absorption term. Okay, it's telling you there's absorption in the system. And absorption exists because I have coupled the system with the medium and I'm allowing for absorption to exist. Let's analyze this system. Let's look at what it does in the rest frame. If I go to the rest frame of the system, uh, the four velocity is just one, zero, 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 and uh, that equation of motion is just simply this, okay? It's the box phi mu squared, except this V alpha grad alpha thing is just C times psi dot, okay? Nothing brilliant. And the brilliant thing is that uh, you solve for what, that, you know, what those modes do, and you find that the mode uh, grows as e to the, well, grows or decays as e to the minus CT over two, okay? So just, uh, you know, plug in some ansatz and solve, uh, for positive momentum or whatever, and you will find that the amplitude of the mode depends on as e to the minus ct over 2. The crucial thing is that when c is positive, this mode is damped. That is called absorption, right? Uh, that's typically what happens. Uh, but of course, if the c happens to change sign, the mode will grow, right? Mathematically, that's, that's how you see it, okay? And let's see how that happens. So let's take a system. They're the same system as before. Uh, c is still positive, so you would naively expect this thing to be, uh, 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 you know, the mode should be absorbed. Uh, but now we're considering a medium that's just not moving, but it's actually rotating. It's spinning, okay? It's, it's rotating at something. So the rotational velocity, of course, is this thing, right? One, zero, zero, omega r sine theta, okay? The spherical, and we pick spherical coordinates that are aligned along the rotation axis. And uh, uh, actually, this phenomenon in this particular language was discovered by Zeldovich uh, back in the 1960s, so you really know this is true. I'm not just making this shit up, okay? It's actually true. Uh, uh, okay, what are we gonna do? We're going to take this uh, equation of motion, there is this coupling, and we're going to look at the angular momentum modes of this field psi, okay? That is, the psi is, for example, the axion field, right? Uh, that is bound to the star. So let's look at the angular momentum modes. That's what they look like, okay? Uh, uh, you know, azimuthally quantized. And plug in, okay? Some grunge, grunge, grunge. The key point about this grunge is that when you plug that in over here, you're going to find that the coefficient for C contains this term mu minus m omega. Okay, that's what happens when you plug that in there. Okay. Uh, um, and what you see is that when m is sufficiently big, this term flips sign. Right? So this is exactly the same condition that we, that we arrived at for uh, previously just from energetic considerations. Talking about absorption and asking when the absorption can become an emission, we said for sufficiently large angular momentum, the kinematic zero was allowed, and you would have thought, in, like in that language, oh, I, I now have phase space, I should be able to do it. In this rigorous mathematical language, uh, you see that when m is big enough, this term flips sine, which means that instead of this term being absorption, it becomes emission, right? The, the amplitude of the mode will start growing, okay? So the same kinematic condition that we saw before, and absorption then becomes emission, okay? And that was what Zeldovich claimed, and it's true, uh, back in the 60s. So now that we have, I've convinced you with uh, Soviet mathematics, uh, uh, let's figure out uh, how efficient the system actually is, okay? Where does it grow? How big does it actually happen, okay? The key point to note is that this absorption is all happening only inside the star, right? I mean, if I'm out in free space, there's no absorption happening, so who cares? Uh, uh, so uh, all of this growth is only happening uh, like within your star, which has a radius of size r. And obviously the rate the rate at which you can enhance, the rate at which you can emit, will depend upon the overlap of the mode that you have, with, like with the stellar medium. Because the stellar medium is this small, and your mode is gigantically far away, there's no overlap, and like nothing happens. Okay? So, unsurprisingly, the uh, rate of growth will be proportional to the probability of finding your particle, the, your axion or whatever, in the star, right? Because there's some mode sitting somewhere, if most of the time your particle is sitting far away, it's not gonna have a big chance to get absorbed. All right, so how do we calculate that? So once again, this is a picture. We've got a star that is spinning. There are gravitational bound states of this axion or whatever around it. They, they automatically exist once they exist, uh, once the particle exists. And uh, uh, these wave functions are essentially hydrogenic levels, right? This is some one over r potential. The, gra the potential is gravitational, not some electromagnetic thing, but there's some gravitational potential. So there is some uh, you know, Bohr radius and hydrogenic atom with the Schrodinger problem. Uh, which is localized at a position one over gm mu squared. That's what it is. 
Okay? So uh, you, you can open up your favorite book of quantum mechanics, and uh, you can figure out how these wave functions behave at short distances. Right? So you'll find out that at short distances, because you know, most of the time we care about uh, the, the overlap with the star, where the star is at you know, the center of the system uh, and has some fixed size r, what you find is that at short distances, these wave functions look like r over the Bohr radius, roughly, to the power l, where l is the angular momentum of the, of the, of the mode. Right? So you know that if you have an S-wave, the S-wave always has support at the origin, but the higher angular momentum modes don't. Right? They, they vanish at the origin, and uh, the rate at which they vanish is given by this. Okay? Uh, and, and for super radians, we always have to have, po have positive angular momentum. Right? We're always emitting angular momentum modes, so L is always at least bigger than or equal to 1. Right? That's where it happens. So now we can plug that in. So we see that this is R to the L times whatever, gm mu squared to the L. Whatever. Okay? Strongly dependent on what L is. Okay, so uh, uh, that we already know. Uh, so that's the size of the overlap, right? Now you can kind of estimate what the rate should be. The rate should go as some size squared, right? Some probability distribution. That's what it should be, okay? Uh, uh, so, uh, and then you do some volume integral, okay? I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the exact details of how you do this, uh, but it's not too surprising, right? So the, pro the probability of finding the star inside this, uh, uh, it's the probability of finding this uh, particle inside the star should go as psi star psi, right? And psi star psi would mean you get r to the 2l over here, the 2l there. And then you do some integral over d cube r, which gives you an extra power of 3. Okay, that's the basic idea. And you can kind of rigorously show this as well. But you know, this is the intuition. And then you see that this basically grows as gm, the mass of the star, uh, mu squared, where mu is the mass of the particle, and r is the size of the star. Uh, and the whole thing raised to the power 2l plus 3. Okay, so pretty rapid dependence on power, if you look at it there. All right. So let's look at what kind of systems are most efficient. All right. So for you to be super radiant, you've got to satisfy the condition that mu minus m omega is less than zero. Okay. And uh, you know, that, that's when you're super radiant. That's the condition. And uh, uh, if, you, if you have sensible modes, sensible angular momentum modes, you always require that the, the uh, orbital angular momentum is bigger than the azimuthal ang angular momentum m. Okay. So that is, if you, if you want large m, you also have to have large l. That's what it is. Okay. So there are sort of uh, two ways in which this process can be suppressed. So if you have a particle whose mass is really small, right, like a, like a photon, for example, whose mass is zero, or a super light axion, when it's very, very light, then even the lowest angular momentum modes, even the L equal to one mode is super radiant, except the Bohr radiance for that guy is super far away. If you're a light particle, you're super far away. So your overlap is killed. And your overlap is killed as mu squared to the raised to the power 2L plus one. So rapidly, rapidly killed. Right? So if you're a light particle, super radiance is super inefficient. So you want to essentially go for the, you want to keep tweaking up your mass. You want to, the mass has to be very big so that the uh, particle is bound close to the star. But if you have too big a mass, right, if the mass is, let's say, 100 GeV or something gigantic, then obviously uh, it is true that there are certain angular momentum modes that will be super radiant, but those will be modes with super large angular momentum. So once again, they will also be far away. Right? So there's kind of a natural uh, sense in which the most, efficient, uh, 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 particle, the most efficient particle production occurs when the uh, mass of the star, mass of the particle is comparable to the rotation rate of the star. Because right? that way you minimize yourself on this side and you minimize losses on this side. Right? It's sort of like roughly, a, it's not a resonance, but it's sort of a, that's a broad region where this is most efficient. Okay. And so, OK, so let's pick mu to be order omega, the rotation rate of the star. And then what you then want to do is maximize everything else. right? You want to make everything else as big as possible. right? So you want to basically say, I want to take the largest possible mass here and the largest possible radius, because the biggest those two things are, the larger my effects. right? That, that rate is directly proportional to those numbers raised to some high power. So the bigger they are, the bigger my oomph. But I can't make something, uh, if, if, a, if some object is rotating, I can't really make its size arbitrarily big, right? Because at some point, omega r will become order 1, and then the special relativity kills you, OK? So what you need is that, given a particular uh, sort of rotation rate, you want to pick the largest possible object that is spinning maximally at that frequency, OK? So in particular, given a rotation rate, if you, let's say you want to constrain a particle of mass mu, you want to find an object which is rotating at that rate, omega, where mu is order, order omega. And then you want to find an object that is spinning as fast as possible at that frequency. Okay, that's an extremal object, that's what it's called. 
So the examples of these kinds of things are extremal curved black holes, right? Uh, those are supposed to exist. We don't, observational evidence, a little bit sketchy. But theoretically, you can have a, a, a sort of a curved black hole, which is spinning as fast as possible, okay? So if you see such spinning black holes that are as fast as possible, they would be a good environment for you to go and search for these things. The second object uh, possibilities are these things called millisecond pulsars. So for example, uh, millisecond pulsars are not quite as extremal as extremal black holes, because, you know, in a sense like your extremal black hole uh, is only bounded by general relativity. It can really be super extremal. Millisecond pulsars are sort of more bounded by reality, in the sense that uh, you know, we've, uh, uh, you know, QCD doesn't let you spin arbitrarily fast, but they can go pretty damn fast. So for example, the fastest objects we've observed in the universe are, uh, uh, of these millisecond pulsars spin at like 714 hertz. That's a pretty rapid frequency to think about, it, right? A star spinning like 700 times a second, okay? Uh, and that's the maximum thing we've actually observed. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff to say over here, but uh, let me just give you the overall view on where we are in this case, okay? So, uh, uh, if you have extremal black holes, okay, if those exist, then uh, they are naturally absorptive, right? So remember, for super radians, we said we need absorption, okay? So the moment you have absorption, you always have super radians. And in an extremal black hole, uh, there's gravity. Gravity can absorb stuff. And in fact, in a black hole, you go in there, you get absorbed by gravity, okay? And uh, uh, so that's a very clean way in which the object actually, uh, your, 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 uh, your axion, for example, can get absorbed by the black hole. And the moment you have that absorption, you always have this emission once you satisfy the kinematic condition. For millisecond pulsars, absorption can happen through non-gravitational interactions. Gravity of a millisecond pulsar is not big enough to make things absorb, right? Because if you just throw a particle uh, at, 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 at a millisecond pulsar and gravitationally it'll just go through and bounce up, right? But you throw it at a black hole, it gets absorbed. So gravity is not strong enough, but particles like axions typically have non-gravitational interactions. So you can try to use the non-gravitational interactions to, to create the absorption necessary to uh, do this sort of emission. So for the case of gravity, things are pretty clean for absorption, and uh, for, for, for millisecond pulsars, it's a little bit more different. The difficulty, though, is that it's very hard to actually measure the rotation rate of a black hole, right? A black hole is black. Yeah. So you can't really look at it with your eyes and be like, oh, that black hole is spinning at some rate. So there is a lot of uh, unknown systematics, sorry, there are, there's a lot of systematics in this, in this case, okay? Which is that you have to ultimately model some astrophysical system uh, pretty well in order to be able to extract the spin from it. And that's an evolving field. I think uh, definitely progress is possible in that field, but there is definitely systematics uh, involved with astrophysical modeling. And the unfortunate thing, of course, is that these, uh, these bounds, as we said, they depend upon very sharp powers of the rotation rate, right? They go as some power two to the L plus three and stuff like that. So even if you screw up a bit on your rotation rate, you actually have large uncertainties on what, how rapid the, the rate actually is. So in the case of black holes, that's kind of a problem in that it's hard to measure the spin directly. For millisecond pulsars, the, the good thing is that the spin and the orbital issues are well measured, right? You can go look at your, with your eyes at some pulsar and, it, and you know what rate it's spinning, right? You can't really argue about that. So the spin, et cetera, are, are, are very clean and uh, it's possible to make clean measurements, okay? Uh, but the difficulty, of course, is that uh, uh, you don't know the interior of the neutron star that well, of the pulsar that well. Right? So for the black hole, the interior is very simple. You know what the black hole is, it's very clean. While for things like uh, neutron stars, you actually have to calculate the absorption. And the calculation of the absorption is messier because a neutron star is a messier object than the uh, black hole. Right? So it's kind of a funny situation where theoretically the black hole is clean, but the measurements are hard. While for uh, millisecond pulsars, the measurements are, are straightforward. Okay? But the calculations are, are ugly because it involves the interior of the star itself. Okay? Anyway, this is an evolving field, and I expect actually good progress to be made uh, here. So, uh, uh, but that is very clean, simply because of the fact that that's a situation where all you need to do is just postulate that the particle exists. If it exists somewhere in the spectrum, then super radians will produce it, populate it, and you can go and actually make a measurement, and things are good. So we're gonna move on from that uh, story to talking about how one can detect axions if they were the dark matter of the universe. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about this experiment uh, that is uh, likely to happen, uh, very likely to happen, uh, called the Cosmic Axion Spin Precession Experiment, or CASPER. So let's review what uh, axion dark matter is, okay? So uh, going back, we were talking about, uh, you know, if you wanna think about a boson like a photon, 
One very sensible way of thinking about that is as individual particles moving around. Uh, another way is to say that the photon is nothing but some electromagnetic field, some classical electromagnetic field that is, has some amplitude and is oscillating at some frequency omega, right? And one way in which you want to detect uh, things like photons is uh, by measuring the time-varying electromagnetic field associated with it. So if you have a photon, some radio wave, for example, uh, you can have an antenna sitting there, and the time-varying electromagnetic field uh, of the photon will come in and drive uh, currents in the antenna, and that's something you can go see. Okay? Uh, so that's one way to measure this. As I said yesterday, the uh, particles like axions, you can think of them as, as individual particles, but uh, just as legitimate way of thinking about them is just to think about them as uh, a classical field. Exactly like how you think about photons from a laser as a classical field, you can also think about these kinds of particles, these super light bosonic particles, as some kind of oscillating classical field. Right? The key difference, of course, is that these guys have a mass, so they have, no, they have a mass and they're very cold. Their velocity is very small compared to their mass. Uh, uh, so essentially all that matters here is a time variation, while for a photon, because it is a massless particle, the momentum and the frequency are always coupled, right? For, for things like the axion, the, the uh, velocity part is not as important, although we will actually use it, but still, it's not that important, okay? And of course, in the early universe, we said these fields are just completely constant throughout the universe, you know, dead constant field, they're just coherently oscillating as A0 co cosine mt, okay? But we don't have the luxury of living in the early universe, we live today, and today we said that the axion is actually a uh, uh, you know, random field, right? It's sort of fallen the galaxy. Bad things have happened to it. There are all these bumps and wiggles everywhere. But even though it's a random field, I can still think about it as a random, I mean, as a, as a random classical field. I can still define a correlation length. I can say the field has one value here. How far do I have to go before the field becomes order one different? I'm just reviewing what we said yesterday. And uh, think of, thinking about that in Fourier space tells you that the correlation length is about one over mv where m is the mass of the particle and v is the velocity, okay? Now, usually for an experiment, we're not just interested in a correlation length, we're also interested in a coherence time, which is like, how much time do I really have to sit somewhere and, uh, and like observe some effect, right? Like, if you have an antenna, for example, you, and there's a radio wave coming in, you want to ask, well, how long can I sit and have the radio wave drive the antenna, right? That's how you would build up the current of the antenna to see it. So similarly, when you're trying to do something with these axions, and these axions are oscillating, and there's some detector out there, you want to know for how long can you sit there and, uh, have the, and have the axion drive something to see it. And so the coherence time is then basically given by the fact that the Earth is moving through the axion field, right? And the axion is going to have a constant velocity, uh, is going to, the field is going to be more or less constant over a distance 1 over mv, and the Earth is moving through that field at a speed v as well. Right, because that is the relative velocity between the Earth and the dark matter is also the same V that is sitting in here, which means that the coherence time is 1 over mv squared. Okay? And it is very interesting coherence time, basically because let us say that the mass of the axion is a megahertz, okay? Some, a typical number that you get in these, in these fields, and you find that when V is about 10 to the minus 3, which, is, which it is in the galaxy, the coherence time is about a second. Okay? And that's again a crazy number, because a second is nothing compared to the Hubble scale, right? That is the natural time scale of the galaxy, right? So if you look at galactic time scales of 10 billion years, a coherence time of a second is useless, it's nothing. But a second is very interesting for human beings, because that's the scale at which we operate. So we can actually go and build experiments that are able to uh, you know, do stuff at, at like second time scales for us to go see it. So the central idea behind pretty much all axion experiments and how they detect it is that somehow they're going to leverage the fact that this, there's an oscillating classical field that is moving around. And much like how you uh, detect photons, by the fact that you can have a radio, like, like some antenna, and the electromagnetic field goes back and forth and drives it. Similarly, you're going to come up with some way to make use of the axion field's oscillations. The axion field will be oscillating, it'll be driving something, and you, want to, and you want to detect that. And in these systems, there is a natural possibility of a resonance, okay? Uh, basically because the field is coherent for about 10 to the 6 oscillations, right? So if I, if I have the coherence time, which is 1 over mv squared, and v is about 10 to the minus 3, the field will then be coherent for about 10 to the 6 oscillations. So there's a natural resonance possible so you can enhance your signal in this game. Okay, that's kind of the broad plot of pretty much how every axion detection experiment works in this frequency range. So how does ADMX work? ADMX are these microwave cavities. We very briefly discussed them yesterday before we run out of time. Uh, so ADMX is uh, trying to detect axions if uh, you know, this parameter FA is about 10 to the 12 GeV, okay? Microwave cavity experiments. How do they work? 
They're making use of the fact that uh, axions coupled to electromagnetism, A over F, F of dual, E dot B or whatever, and then you basically have some microwave cavity and you put some large magnetic field. The axion comes in, it's some classical field coming in. There's a, there's, a, there's a classical magnetic field out there. And because of this coupling E dot B, you put that in your, uh, I mean, you, you just take that into your classical Lagrangian and you'll find that uh, because there's this coupling E dot B, uh, your, your classical axion field in the presence of a classical magnetic field will drive a classical electric field, okay? N not, not all that brilliant. And uh, uh, th so that's what they do. So they build a resonant cavity. They build a resonant cavity because, you know, they would, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's a resonance possible. So essentially, the way you want to think about it is that, like, you know, when you normally take a cavity, right? If, if there's some electromagnetic cavity, you drive it by pumping electromagnetic fields into it. Here, you have a cavity, there's a magnetic field, the axion is driving it because the axion comes in, creates a tiny electric field which drives the cavity, right? That's basically how you see it. And ADMX is a great experiment, and they can search for axions if F is about 10 to the 12 GeV. However, it is basically impossible for them to go to, uh, uh, for, to search for axions at much lighter uh, uh, masses or much larger FA, right? It's, it's just impossible for them to do this. And this is really due to like two fundamental reasons, okay, with this, with this very way of detection. The first is that ultimately uh, they're searching for a conversion of the axion to a photon. That's what they're looking for, right? And that is basically a, uh, so if you convert, you know, if you calculate the rate for this, all of the interactions of the axion are suppressed by 1 over f. So when you go from the matrix element to the cross section for a conversion, you're going to pay a 1 over f squared, okay, matrix element squared. That is true. They're also suppressed by another big factor, which is that for them to convert uh, you know, this axion resonantly, okay, they have to match the size of their cavity to the wavelength of the axion, right? Because when you have a resonant conversion, it better be the case that your resonator has the same size or somehow resonantly locked to the frequency that you're converting, okay? So if uh, F is above 10 to the 12 GeV for the QCD axion, this gives a uh, wavelength, you know, if you look at the wavelength of the particle, to be about a few centimeters. So they can easily build a few centimeter sized cavity and have this resonant conversion of axions to photons, and that's something they can see. But when f becomes bigger, remember that the mass of the QCD axion goes down, it's lambda squared over f, right? So when f becomes bigger, the wavelength of the axion gets enormous, okay? So they would have to build a gigantic cavity in order to sort of resonantly convert uh, this very low frequency axion into, 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 uh, into a photon that can sit in there. So for example, when F is, let's say, about 10 to the, like around 10 to the 16 GeV, like the gut scale, the cavity size has to be a kilometer, right? So you, you're not going to build a kilometer size cavity and be able to control it uh, that well. And if F is at the Planck scale, that's 1,000 kilometers, almost the size of the Earth. No, you, know, you know, there's no way you're going to build that, right? So if you don't do that, if, you, if, if, you don't, if your cavity size doesn't increase to match the size of the axion wavelength, you know, your signal efficiency is rapidly killed. Okay, in fact, it dies as 1 over f cubed. So you put those things together as 1 over f to the fifth. Okay? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, pardon my French here, but like that f is not the right f you want there. Okay? So uh, 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 this therefore raises a theoretical question, right? It's super reasonable that uh, axions exist over here, uh, but you need a different operator, a different way of detecting this because this operator just wouldn't do. It's not going to work. Okay, how do, you, how do you do that? Okay, so let's see uh, uh, what happens. Going back to one of the earlier slides here. Think about the problem very globally, right? All we have is some Goldstone boson. How can light Goldstone bosons couple to the standard model? They can couple to electromagnetism. I mean, this is just F of dual. I was written that in a fancy way. Uh, I was trying to please someone wealthy once, and I just stole the slide from there. But uh, anyway, this is F of dual. So the, 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 that's what all current searches are looking for. Right? And, uh, uh, but there are two other couplings that the axion can have. Uh, it can couple to gluons. In fact, that is the defining coupling of the axion to QCD, right? To GG dual or G wet G, the same thing. Uh, or it can also couple to fermions to this very general operator, d mu A, psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi. Okay? And the Casper experiment, it's a proposal to go and search for these two couplings of the axion. Okay. So, uh, Here's the idea behind Casper, okay? The strong CP problem, remember, that's the reason why we even introduced axions in the first place, was that if you had an operator theta GG dual, 
That will create a nucleon EDM that is order 310 to the minus 16 times theta. Okay? That was a strong CP problem. Now, let's say that the axion is a dark matter of the universe. If the axion is a dark matter of the universe, there is a background value for the axion field. A is non-zero, right? That's all this energy density. So there's, a, there's an A over F sitting in there. Okay? And, uh, but exactly the same physics, this will create a nucleon electric dipole moment that is order 310 to the minus 16 times A over F. Okay? Same physics. Let's estimate how big that is. Okay? So uh, what do you do? You say A of t is A naught cosine mt. You know the mass of the axion, the QCD axion is lambda QCD squared over FA, uh, which is about this number. And then what we say, I have to figure out how big this amplitude really is. So I'm going to take the local dark matter density and equate that to m squared a squared. And m squared a squared is this number 0.3 g, sorry, this local dark matter density is this famous number 0.3 GeV per centimeter squared. So with that, I can calculate this ratio A over F. Okay? And what you find is something very interesting, which is that uh, this number, A over F, is 3 times 10 to the minus 19, independent of FA. So no matter what scale the axion comes from, this ratio A over F is independent of F. Okay? Why is that? Well, basically because I have made the assumption that uh, this, this quantity MA is a constant, that M squared A squared, I've assumed that no matter what FA I'm sitting at, this is all the dark matter of the universe. And then it is just the case that for high F axions, the mass is so light that, the ratio, that this, this quantity MA is a constant. Okay? So, uh, 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 so, sorry, that quantity A, A or F is a constant. Right? So this is cool. If you had some way of detecting this uh, uh, very tiny field value, right? so this tiny field value will give rise to a nucleon EDM, as we said earlier, okay? because A or F exactly gives rise to an EDM. So if you had some way of detecting this tiny EDM, you are suddenly able to detect a wide range of, ax of FA. Right? It doesn't matter what the value of FA is. It's all going to give you the same EDM value. And that becomes a very powerful way to search for this, unlike ADMX, where as you went to high F, your signal was dropping less, like, as F to the fifth. Now, this is a super small EDM. This is about nine orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the current bound on the static EDM of, uh, of, of, you know, uh, uh, that has been searched for. But very importantly, the electric dipole moment introduced by this uh, axion is not static. It will be oscillating okay, at a frequency set by the mass of the axion, which is kilohertz to gigahertz. How does that happen? Because the axion field is some A naught cosine mt, and this m is some mass of the, of the particle. right? So it is true that we have searched for, the, for like a time-independent EDM, like a theta QCD that doesn't change at all. And that is constrained at some level. But this EDM induced by the axion is varying in time. Okay? And uh, 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 the fact that something is varying in time is experimentally super useful, as we will shortly see. Okay? So that is one operator. Uh, so when, you, when, when your axion couples to gluons, it's able to give rise to a time-dependent electric dipole moment. The other thing is that the axion also couples to fermions. We talked about that. And this is true not just for the QCD axion. It's also true for axion-like particles, the general way to look for them. D mu phi over F, uh, psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi. Go to the non relativistic limit of this operator, and you will find that if you take the nucleon operator, uh, then this field couples to the nucleon operator, to, like to the Hamiltonian of the nucleons, as grad phi dotted to the spin of the nucleus. Okay? That's what that looks like in the non relativistic limit. Now, if you have axion dark matter, okay, since there's a great spatial gradient, I'm going to uh, expand it out in uh, uh, space as well. So if the, if the axion dark matter, it's some phi of tx as a local field. It's some phi naught cosine mt, as it always used to be. But then I also have a small piece that depends upon the velocity of the dark matter. Right? That's what it is. Like nothing brilliant. This is just e to the i, you know, omega t plus kx. So in the presence of axion dark matter, your nucleon Hamiltonian, okay, all I'm going to do is take this uh, operator, plug it in there is going to be, uh, and, and then calculate what it is, right? So this phi is uh, phi naught cosine mt plus m phi dot x. Take the gradient. You'll find that the nucleon operator is basically m phi times phi naught times the velocity of the axion dotted in the spin of the nucleus. That's just coming in from plugging that in there. OK? So if you look at this coupling, this looks exactly like how a magnetic field would couple to a spin, like b dot s, right? So here we find that if you if you are in the galaxy, these axions are moving with, with, with a certain velocity, and there is therefore a velocity dot spin coupling, which looks exactly like how a magnetic field couples to a spin. Okay. So if you have a if you have a spin and, and there's a magnetic field, that will cause a, that is say perpendicular to the spin, the spin will start processing, right? And now here you've got an axion velocity, okay, the velocity of the dark matter, if you will. If you if you place a spin perpendicular to it, the spin will start processing. 
in exactly the same way. Okay? You can estimate how big that precession thing is. Uh, so this quantity m phi times phi naught turns out to be about 10 to the minus 5 tesla. It's pretty big. Okay? There's a lot, lot, lot of local dark matter density. So this estimating how big m phi times phi naught is just taking the square root of dark matter density. That's about 10 to the minus 5 tesla. It's a pretty big magnetic field. Okay? So once you uh, uh, put in the bound that this guy is very weakly coupled, a 10 to the 9 GeV or so, that's the uh, uh, most strongly it could be coupled, that is something like a femtotesla oscillating magnetic field. It's you know, that's, uh, it's of course a small magnetic field, but I would argue it is within the capabilities of uh, precision instruments. Okay. But, but that's what we're looking at, right? We're looking at if the axions exist and they're the dark matter and they're coupled with that thing, you're, uh, with, that, with that strength, you're looking at a femtotesla oscillating magnetic field, okay, in your system. All right, so let's put it all together in a nice picture. Here's what happens, okay? For axion-like particles, I also call them general axions, whatever, bad name. For axion-like particles, suppose you have a neutron, okay? The neutron is sitting there, it's got, a it's got a spin. You expose it to the velocity of the axion. This is the dark matter velocity of the axion. Uh, because of this operator, okay, uh, this spin will start processing about the direction of that velocity. Just like how a magnetic field will cause the spin to process, this velocity will also cause the spin of the, of the neutron to process, like so, okay? And uh, if you calculate what it is, it's something like a femtotesla magnetic field, okay? Oscillating at some frequency given by the mass of the axial. Uh, we can ignore that comment. Take the QCD axion, okay? That is the axion that couples the gluon specifically. And now if you have a neutron, okay, again, sitting in there, then uh, all you do is you expose the neutron to the, uh, I mean, like to the axion dark matter, because of QCD, because of all of the reasons why we introduced the axion in the first place, uh, this neutron will acquire a tiny electric dipole moment. Okay? This dipole moment will be uh, al along the direction of the nuclear spin. That's the only vector in town. And uh, uh, if you put in the numbers, it gives rise to an, to an electric dipole moment that's order 10 to the minus 34 e centimeters, oscillating at a frequency equal to the mass of the axion. What do you do? You can apply some electric field and that electric field will then cause the nuclear spin to process. So if you take a magnetic dipole and you apply a magnetic field, the spin will process. Similarly, if you have an electric dipole and you apply a, an, 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 an electric field, the spin will again process, okay? Like that. So the fundamental idea is that what we have seen is that under appropriate conditions, axions can cause nuclear spins to process. Either it is because of the velocity of the axion that causes the spin to process, or it's the QCD axion, it acquires an EDM, and you apply an electric field and the spin processes. So if you had some clever way of measuring the rotation of the spin, you can detect the axion. Okay, that's the basic idea of CASPER, and hence the name, Cosmic Axion Spin Procession Experiment. How do you do that? Thankfully, well before any of us in this collaboration uh, was born, there's a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance that's been around for 60 years or something, right? It's fantastic. Here's what you do. You take a block of material, and you align all the nuclear spins in one direction, okay? And, uh, you know, this can be done, okay? Now, let's say you apply some electric field, okay? What that's going to do is that if the axion is the dark matter of the universe, then all of those spins will start processing. That, that's what we argue, right? If you, if, you take a, if you take a spin and you apply an electric field, then the spin starts processing. Each spin, of course, has its own magnetic moment, has its own magnetic field, right? And as the spins process, the, the magnetic field of the spin will start rotating as well, right? So if, if you have a bunch of spins that are all in one direction and the spins turn slightly, the magnetic field will also turn slightly, okay? And that slight change in the magnetic field can be picked up by what's called a squid. The squid is a very fancy uh, device that measures magnetic fields, okay? It's a very sensitive way of measuring magnetic fields. So, so, so that's what you're trying to pick up, that in the presence of the axion, in the presence of the axion, the nuclear spins will slightly process, okay? And that's something you can that, you, that you can detect with a uh, uh, precise magnetometer, okay? And there's a natural possibility of a resonance in the story because of the following point. I can apply some external magnetic field to the system, okay? So it's just, so it's just like NMR. So when you apply an external magnetic field, there's a lot more precession frequency in the system. This is just a standard story. If you have a spin in a magnetic field, you apply a B field, there's a natural resonant frequency for the system set with a lot more frequency, okay? Now, the axion effect is also time-varying. 
Remember, that was very crucial to this whole story, right? The axion is either causing nuclear electric dipole moments that oscillate at a frequency given by the axion mass, or with velocity, the same thing happens. They, they keep oscillating back and forth. It's a femtotesla magnetic field that's oscillating back and forth. So if the Lormov precession frequency of the system is equal to the axion mass, there's a resonant enhancement, right? When the two of them match, you have a big uh, 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 spin precession. And that is something one can use. Okay? Of course, in practice, we don't actually know what the mass of the axion is. Nobody's told us what that is. So what one would actually do is that uh, you would pick some external magnetic field, and you would slowly keep changing it. And you will find one point where there's a big resonant enhancement. And that's the place where you detect the axion, if you see it. So I'm not going to go into details of what these plots are and whatever. Uh, uh, but this is basically the projected sensitivity of these experiments. Okay, so this is the coefficient of the axion coupling to the EDM here, and this is the mass in electron volts. I guess this is kind of a little bit messed up in the, in the, in the slide here when it shows up. And in, uh, in EV at the bottom and frequency in hertz at the top, okay. Uh, the crucial point to note is this. This purple line is where the QCD axion exists if that is the dark matter of the universe, okay. And uh, this blue region here is where ADMX is searching for it right now, a rather narrow set of frequencies. And anywhere where this solid red line intersects and goes below this purple line, that is where this experiment will be sensitive to the QCD axion. So as, you know, with some reasonable technological improvements, this experiment has the ability to search for QCD axions above a scale of 10 to the 16 GeV. Okay, so if FA is above 10 to the 16 GeV, if this experiment really works as we think it should, it can search for the QCD axions. So you really have an ability to search for really high F axions above the gut scale if they're the dark matter of the universe. Similarly, if you are looking for the velocity of the axion, the axion wind, it's in a sense a simpler experiment, because all you do is just take a bunch of nuclear spins. Don't, like, you don't even have to apply uh, uh, like some electric field. All you're doing is just putting the, the, the spins up there, and that the velocity of the axion will cause uh, the, all of these spins to process. And as the spins process, the magnetization of the sample will change, and that is something you can pick up with your magnetometer. Okay. Uh, and the same, it's the same idea. This is also a time-varying field. So by tuning the Lormor precession frequency, you can pick up a, uh, a, a big resonance. Okay? So uh, uh, again, so this experiment has an ability to probe pretty deep into the parameter space of axion-like particles. It doesn't quite have the sensitivity to get the QCD axion, but you know, there could be these axion-like particles out there. And uh, uh, one can really you know, go a lot in the parameter space, as opposed to ADMX, which only scans a rather narrow range of frequencies. Here we can go many, many orders of magnitude into the parameter space of these particles. Okay. So here is sort of the discovery potential for where we think this can really work, right? Going back, uh, put everything together, this is the uh, you know, parameter space uh, available for axions. Everything below this is ruled out. Everything above this is open. And this is where the microwave cavities exist. Uh, these NMR-style experiments, they're sort of laboratory experiments, right? Uh, they're not some, you know, massive experiment that thinks it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fancy NMR device, okay? And it really has the abilities to search for axions in this range of frequencies, kilohertz to about 10 megahertz, corresponding to F of about, you know, from about 10 to the 15 GeV onwards to the Planck scale, okay? High F axions. There are definitely, you know, technological challenges ahead. We are pushing forward with this right now. And uh, if you do detect this, like this would be a discovery of dark matter. Uh, that'd be pretty awesome. We'll also discover the axion. And really, it would be telling you uh, physics at some very high scale. Okay? So a lot of interesting things happening in this field right now uh, as we ramp up. So let me summarize sort of the experimental part of this story, which is that you know, a lot of interesting things have happened in axions recently. You know, it's, it's really pretty amazing. There was not a lot happening for a long time, but now in the last few years, I think a lot of interesting developments happening, both in terms of theory and experiment. In terms of theory, there's possibility the super radiance could be a way in which you can really probe these systems using extremal astrophysical systems, uh, subject, of course, to uncertainties, but still, it's a very interesting way to go forward. And experiments like CASPER, which are a way of searching for these things in the, in the laboratory. Okay. So as I promised, uh, you know, I couldn't help myself but want to talk about the, my own paper. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, very briefly, since some of you also asked, about how this is also another use of axions. That's basically, I think, why I, I think it sort of ties in. Uh, a lot of interesting theoretical things happening recently about how one can actually have cosmological relaxation of the electrovic scale. As you all, all know, there is uh, you know, a hierarchy problem to be solved. 
Uh, we proposed ideas like supersymmetry, composite Higgs, uh, you know, large extra dimensions, many interesting ideas out there. Uh, they all typically tend to produce a lot of particles of the LHC, right? And we've not seen them, and that is the big question of uh, uh, the hierarchy problem. Are we sort of, uh, uh, is there a natural solution to this, or do we live in some anthropic uh, multiverse uh, sort of scenario? Uh, depending upon which university you come from in the world, uh, one of those things is more popular than the other. You know, uh, but here is kind of my claim, right? If you want to solve the hierarchy problem, and you, and you know, uh, uh, and it's not due to like some new, brand new physics of the LHC, uh, I think this is a possibility, which is that the Higgs mass was not always big; it was uh, was not always small. That in the very early universe, the Higgs mass would have been super super large, and something about the evolution of cosmology uh, puts you in a situation where the Higgs mass becomes naturally small. And the bold claim is the following. If the QCD axion existed, it's not, the, it's not the vanilla QCD axion, it's a little bit different. But if the QCD axion existed, and let's say you had a long period of inflation, our claim is that that is sufficient to solve the hierarchy problem cosmologically. Okay, that's the claim. How does it happen? Well, here's a Lagrangian that does it. Okay? So this is a Lagrangian of the Higgs, for example. This is the Higgs, the standard model Higgs. It's got a gigantic mass. This M is at the cutoff. It's not, a, it's not at the weak scale. It's some huge mass which you think it should have from loops and all of that stuff, right? And this phi is just your axion, okay? So this phi uh, is a standard axion. It's got a cosine potential, as we argued. This is the QCD scale to the fourth, that kind of stuff, okay? But uh, that by itself, of course, doesn't do anything for you. So we're going to couple the axion slightly differently in the story. In particular, we will give a coupling of the axion to the Higgs field, right? So we will say that the axion also couples with the Higgs through this operator. This specific operator breaks the shift symmetry of the axion. As we talked about earlier, these particles like axions have, you know, they're Goldstone bosons, so they're supposed to have some derivative coupling that has a shift symmetry. But we break that explicitly by giving this particular coupling, okay? And this, and this G will be tiny, will be a small coupling. But what this does for you is that once you have this coupling, this tells you that the value of the axion field also controls the mass of the Higgs, obviously, right? Given a particular value of the axion field, there's a particular mass of the Higgs. Okay, so that's, you know, guts of the idea. And the moment you turn on this coupling, you've obviously broken the shift symmetry of the axion. It's no longer shift symmetry invariant. So you'll end up generating all these other terms that break the shift symmetry, all of them, of course, proportional to G itself. So there'll be a G M squared phi. If you will, that comes about because I close the Higgs loop here, or the G squared phi squared, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the way to think about this from the point of view of quantum field theory is that uh, this field phi is some uh, you know, non-compact field, that, that, that's a technical term for it. It's some, it's some scalar field, okay? It's got a shift symmetry. The shift symmetry is preserved by this operator, okay? Uh, but it's broken explicitly by this coupling, and all of the breaking is parameterized by that coupling G. That's the right way to think about it. The scale M is the scale where we cut off all standard model loops. It's not the weak scale, it's something very high. And here is what can happen. So in the early universe, okay, uh, uh, we will assume uh, that the story is such that in the very early universe, this field has some order one value, okay, some big value, and the Higgs mass is something big and positive. Some huge value is big and positive, it's not at the weak scale, okay? So the big, uh, so when the Higgs has a positive mass squared, the Higgs has no VEV, okay? That's crucial, okay? So when the Higgs has no VEV, the axion also has no mass, right? As we said earlier, uh, it was important for the axion to have, for, for the axion mass is controlled by the Higgs mass but the Higgs web, sorry. Because when there's a massless quark in the theory, the axion formally has no mass, okay? So in the early universe, when the Higgs has a positive mass squared, there is no uh, 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 mass for the axion, okay? There's no, sorry, this, this, this term doesn't exist for the axion. This term is zero. It just has these terms that are sort of heartbreaking terms. They exist. This term is zero, okay? So we just have uh, these terms, that's it. Now what we assume is that during inflation, the axion is not the inflaton, it's just some field sitting there during inflation. We assume that the field phi will slowly roll, much like how other fields roll during inflation. So as the field rolls, it will scan a variety of Higgs masses, right? Different values of Higgs mass will be there. There will be some point where the mass of the physical mass of the Higgs will go from being positive to being negative. That, that will just occur as you scan, okay? That's an interesting point, right? Because when the Higgs mass goes from being positive to being negative, the Higgs will acquire a VEV. That's what happens, right? And that VEV can then be used to turn on a back reaction on the motion of this field phi and prevent it from growing, right? The key point is that 
if this phi field rolls such that at a particular point in the Higgs mass is tiny, you know, when it goes from being positive to being negative, if there are barriers that pop up that prevent it from growing, then you can make the field phi get stuck at a particular point for a long period of time, thereby making this mass squared very small, dynamically, okay, through cosmological evolution. And the central claim is that the QCD axion does this for you automatically. Why is that? Well, as we said earlier, the mass of the QCD axion secretly depends upon the Higgs web, right? And the Higgs has no web. The, the quark masses are t uh, don't exist formally. There's some tiny Yukawa coupling. Okay, there's some contribution from that, but that's a small number. When the Higgs has no web, this barrier term doesn't exist. This term is zero, okay? So the field just keeps rolling. However, as the Higgs web turns on, this barrier starts popping up, preventing things from rolling, okay? So, you know, you can just estimate how big the weak scale really is. It's sort of given by a, a fight between two terms. There's like some linear slope, this gm squared phi that's actually causing the field to roll, and then there is this barrier that's popping up. And when these two things become comparable, that's when the field stops rolling, and you have a formula for the weak scale, right? So the weak scale is given by a combination of parameters like this. Okay, so naturally, so by picking parameters correctly, so you, ha you do have to pick small numbers. These g's that we pick will be very small, okay? But they're technically natural, right? So uh, uh, by picking the appropriate numbers there, you can get the weak scale to be correct, uh, uh, like in a technically natural way, okay? So there is a long you know, story about how big can we push the cutoff, et cetera, et cetera. You know, discussing that will take too much time. I don't quite have the time for that. I'm happy to talk about it privately if you want. Uh, but in a sense, uh, you know, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable class of models, we were able to push the cutoff all the way up to 1,000 TeV. So th like, this would be a scale, uh, like this would be a story where there's no new physics at the LHC, right? Nothing is seen. Yet the Higgs scale is not some tuned parameter uh, picked by anthropics, but rather it's a parameter that's tuned by cosmological evolution. So that's the story. Thank you. <laughs>